All right, my name is Bill Simmons. That's Sean Fantasy. That is Chris Ryan. Thanks to Sundance TV for hosting us. Thanks to Peroni for sponsoring the event. Um, so we've done this. This is the third year in a row where we've done this with a movie that is about to possibly win the Oscar. Two years ago, we did Get Out. Last year, we did A Star is Born, which I think some people were upset about. Um, Fuck them. This year, I think the... This year, I think people are going to be happy with this choice. Uh, let's go five years from now, because we always like to talk about how the Oscars really shouldn't be awarded until five years from now, because then you avoid mistakes like The Artist. When did, what year did The Artist win? 2015? Or 1917. <laughs> or maybe 1917 in 2025. Um, Sean, five years... Sorry, sorry. All, Chris. all my World War veteran, one veterans out there, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are the real heroes. <laughs> Um, Sean, five years from now, what's going to jump out about this movie? Uh, it depends on if Quentin Tarantino's 10th and final film has been made by then. Because if it hasn't, then we'll still think that he got screwed on not winning the Oscar. But if it has, he probably will get that last Oscar. So it's hard to say. But if his last movie is a five-hour version of Bounty Law, we'll <laughs> probably feel the same way. That wouldn't be ideal. Are you sold on him being done after 10 movies? He's a close personal friend of yours. He's done a couple rewatchables with him. Sure, yeah. Oh, Do you feel nice. like... It's one more movie, that's it, and then he does like prestige TV or who knows? He says he wants to write books, which, I mean, in 2020, that's bold. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. I, I can vouch for his I don't want to write books, but I've written books. Uh, what, what jumps out to you five years from now? Put yourself in 2025, Chris. Yeah, I think it's probably the two lead performances that wind up being iconic for both of these guys and their filmographies, and that we will look back and we'll, we will like associate Rick and Cliff with Brad and Leo the way we do, you know, Michael Corleone with Al Pacino or, you know, like Jake LaMotta with Robert De Niro. Wow, really? That's big. Not necessarily on that level, but I think that they are pretty, like, for these guys in their late later stages, like, what's the other Leonardo DiCaprio other than the Bear movie? Like, what is his, like, signature role of the last, like, eight years? Blood, Blood Diamond. Blood Diamond, that's right. You're just baiting me into doing a, a, a Blood Diamond accent. Um, my reaction when I saw this movie... And my reaction when I rewatched it a couple times since is Brad Pitt is the is the leading sentence. He needed one more of these. I, I think he he's obviously an A-lister. He's a Hall of Famer, the whole thing. But um, I compared it to when Nowitzki won the title in 2011, where Nowitzki was a Hall of Famer anyway. He was gonna be a top 40 guy, and then the title pushed him to a whole other level. And that's what I feel like with this Brad Pitt. It was the performance I always felt like he had in him. He got there in Moneyball. You see shades of it in Moneyball, yeah. Yeah, I think Moneyball, which we loved, which was one of the first rewatchables we ever done. He's had supporting parts. I thought he was awesome in Fight Club. This is like the total package. And when I did a podcast with Wesley Morris about this movie back in August, Wesley was saying like, Brad Pitt was always destined to be a little bit of an older actor. That was going to be his. It's seeming like like his post prime, but really this is his prime. He's a little weathered. It's got some baggage. You think about this character, Cliff, the wife-killing stuntman. We don't know how the wife died. Uh, and this was just like the perfect guy for him to play. So for me, that was the big takeaway. What about you? Well, for years, the cliche about him was that he was a character actor with matinee idle good looks. And so he was always trying to be more interesting and not get stuck playing you know, Greek gods all the time. This is one of the first real supporting performances he's ever given. And so it kind of makes sense because these are the kinds of actors that he actually likes and looks up to. Also in Moneyball, he's kind of yelling a lot and doing things that are not natural to his persona and his personality. If you see him like on the award circuit now, he's pretty laid back. He's pretty funny. He's pretty chill. That's what Cliff Booth is. You know, he can carry himself well, but he's, he's calm. This kind of reminds me of like, I, he, he always reminds me of Newman where it's like there's this really, really like heartthrob beginning like for Newman, it's like movies like HUD, for Pitt, it's stuff like Seven. And then there's like a really good, interesting Nothing says heartthrob like Seven. What's that? <laughs> What's that? Nothing says heartthrob like Seven. I, I, actually, I know a lot of women who thought he was super hot in Seven. You don't know that? Where are, those, are those women alive still? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but then... Uh, What's in the box? <laughs> then like this period, Moneyball, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood is like almost like verdict color of money Newman you know what I mean like it's certainly become a little bit more weathered a little bit more wizened gone through some stuff I was thinking about charisma parts because this is such a charisma part and it can go in a lot of ways right like Clooney's best charisma movie I think was was out of sight mm -hmm. which yeah it's the charisma of him and J-Lo that makes that movie it's also really well done but 
Um, for Paul Newman, it's Slapshot, weirdly. Older Paul Newman, a yeah. little beaten up. That shouldn't have been an awesome movie, and it's awesome, and it holds up 42 years later. But you think of uh, these different A-listers. Sometimes, like, what, what was Tom Cruise's ultimate awesome part? He's basically playing variations of Tom Cruise in these different movies. But I don't know if he had a Cliff Booth part, did he? Would you say he had one? I mean, I think he's I mean, been like looking he's for in one. in need of one right now. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, his last best role is probably Edge of Tomorrow, I would imagine. Right? Eyes Wide Shut. <laughs> um, are we sure? Film. Are we sure he shouldn't have been in the best actor category for this? Brad? Yeah. Does I He's in a lot of the movie. I I kind of feel like it, I was going to save this for later, but I I feel like the while I appreciate the Brad Pitt victory lap, it really kind of blocks out Leo on this one. Like I think DiCaprio is astonishing in this movie. I think it's his best performance ever. Yeah. Really? Literally. Go further. And there's no well, nobody cares. Better than Growing Pains? <laughs> you don't remember better, the scenes with Boner? Better. <laughs> yeah. Better than Growing Pains, better than Basketball Diaries, better than What's Eating Gilbert Grape, better than The Revenant, better than Blood Diamond, better than to Catch Me If You Can, better than everything. But no one cares because he already won. So he won. So we already gave him his moment. We got to talk about Leo all year with The Revenant, which isn't good, sorry. Um, and this is... This is him reflecting on his own fame in a, such an interesting way. It's also like a challenging performance because he's very twitchy, he's insecure, he's breaking down, he's at a weird phase of his life. It's very self-reflective and self-reflexive. And everybody's just like, oh, it's all about Brad. And Brad is incredible in the movie, but actually, to me, it's completely Leo's movie. Yeah. Plus, he allows himself to be fat Leo. <laughs> the end. But Put is on. he just fat Leo now? He puts like. <laughs> Have you noticed that he's 15, just like I'm good he's with a little bit it. of a belly? Yeah. Yeah. God bless. A little heft. Yeah. Liked it. Cat, what, calf length white socks, yeah. a city bike, a vape pen. <laughs> it's like he's just got it all figured out. I will say he's like a little softer on the middle right now, but I met him in person and he was. Name drop. He was. But he has. Sorry, who did you meet in person? I, I met him at a private club. It was yeah. just me and him. We spent like you, 12 you hours together. At Equinox, just getting after it. He wiped down the, the weights and you get in there. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, we, we share a Peloton subscription. Uh, <laughs> but when I met him, he was, he was full tractor beam. Like, he, look, he looks in your eyes and he's like, hey, Leonardo. Did he, did he talk to you? Was that the only thing he said to you, that. though? Yeah, he stopped talking. <laughs> yeah. Got back on the Peloton. Uh, um, one more theme in this movie, which I... Woke movie Twitter's reaction to this movie. I don't know. If You're going there now? Jesus. Later. Now? Save it. First quarter. <laughs> we could save it or we could go there now. But um, I was just astonished by how good the, the theme that Tarantino cared about was the beginning of somebody's career and the end of somebody's career. And to read people being upset that Margot Robbie didn't have more scenes or why didn't they dive into her character further, it's just like, did you guys fucking watch the movie? That wasn't the point. The whole point was you're experiencing the joy of somebody's, the, be, the beginning stages of somebody's career when every single thing that's happening to her is good. There's no backlash. There's no bad review. Everything is just sunny and she's going to the Playboy Mansion and parts are gonna be coming and she goes to a movie theater and she's still not a star yet. Like she, she talks her way into the theater and takes a picture in front of the poster. And you take that and you juxtapose it with Cliff, who, with, uh, I'm sorry, Rick, whose career is falling apart, and he's two years away from being on, like, Dragnet, or whatever. He's on Dragnet. Yeah, he's, Rockford he's lucky, Files, yeah. or whatever. He's going to be the bad guy in Charlie's Angels in 1976. Like, his career's headed that way, and he knows it. And that's the whole point of the movie. We didn't need more Margot Robbie scenes. The scenes that she has are really powerful. Um, I was disappointed. So you want to cancel the cancelers. That's what you're saying. I'd like to... Recancel? Uh, no. <laughs> Three cancelables? C can cancel? We're subscribing to Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, is what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. I just liked what he did, and and I think sometimes we get into this pick apart culture, and this is why all of us love this movie. We watched it; it held up on the rewatch completely. Um, but in the theater, that was my experience watching. I was like, I totally get what he's trying to do. I guess I was disappointed that more people didn't get it. What do you think, Chris? What do I think about? this movie being canceled and uncanceling it. Uh, I think it's a memory piece. Like he said that over and over again. I think that this is largely like a figment of his like imaginative memory. And there's a lot of scenes in this movie that I think can be taken literally or can be taken as 
a character thinking about something and then they're like they're, they're, what you're seeing on screen is coming from their mind. The Margot stuff, the Sharon Tate stuff, I think like is part of like a long-term Tarantino project. I talked about this on Sean's pod when we were originally talking about the movie and I think we talked about it when we talked about Inglorious Bastards where it's like his project is history. Like his project is this like kind of almost like historical correction of a record, which in some sometimes does make people mad, like the way like he goes about doing it. But I think in some ways that that's what this was about, which is about he saw this as a moment where these guys who thought of themselves as heroes, who thought of themselves as traditionally like cowboy masculine heroes, were able to save the day, even if in real life they weren't. Yeah, I think it's a what-if movie. A lot of his movies recently have been what-if movies. I also think that the thing that you're identifying, the sort of initial outrage, which started at Cannes, and then there was a lot of conversation about it around July when it was released, is kind of gone. I think that that conversation about it is kind of over. And it's not, it doesn't seem like it's going to win Best Picture, but it still, I think, is pretty clearly like very high on Tarantino fans' lists and in their hearts. It's still like a very meaningful movie. It's very sweet. It's a very sentimental movie. Un unusually sentimental for him. Should it win Best Picture? Yes. I mean, I, what do you guys I think? I think so. Yeah. Oh, it's pretty mixed. Well, somebody say JoJo? <laughs> JoJo. <laughs> Is Taika here? <laughs> I think it was an awesome movie year. I think we can all agree on that one. I was, you know, every time we worry about the future of movies, we have a year like 2019, it was just so many good things. I game. Include, I include good boys, by the way. Yeah. Uh, but just <laughs> good stuff boys. for yeah. everybody. That was and, the third choice for this pod. Yeah. But you think about, we were doing Grantland in February 2015, and we had that Oscars thing, which we really went all in on. And the fucking artist won, and, and none of us knew what to do, because we kind of felt like it might happen. But it was such a bad movie year, and then I compare it to this year, and it's like, holy shit. Uh, this movie got 10 Oscar nominations, including Best Picture, Director, Actor, Supporting Actor. It's headed toward almost 400 million worldwide. Sean, do, do, I'll give you 30 seconds uh, as an important film person on how hard it is for the mid-range movie to actually make money. Original stories is what's really hard. And this is an original story not based on anything. And uh, yeah, it's really hard at the box office for those movies to succeed. The other thing to note about the box office, this movie didn't open in China because China asked that he edit out certain sections of the film. And so that would have made more money if he had decided to edit the movie, and he said no, and Sony backed him, so. He's like, I'm rich, thanks anyway. Uh, <laughs> this is Leo's, how many films do you think he's done with an Academy Award nominated director, Chris? Like 20. What do you think? 16. 17. So Leo. You know that going into this, or did you just dunk on me? Was that like just like you pulled that out of your head, like a thin air, like you were like seven, six? Uh, you'll just have to live the rest of your life wondering the answer. I think Leo decided in like 1992, I care about two things, Oscar winning directors and supermodels. <laughs> and that's, and that's going to be my jam. Don't judge me. So it's based on uh, Rick Dalton. Do you have a supermodel count as well? or <laughs> I do not have that. Yeah, I would say 17. I don't know how many zeros after the 17. Based on uh, Rick Dalton, Bounty Law Star, which was based on Wanted, Dead or Alive with Steve McQueen, a show that did either of you know even existed? I did. I've never seen it. I didn't know Steve McQueen was a TV star. I, I tried a watching a bunch of the television westerns that get referenced they're really in this bad. movie. They're, they're tough, hang. Yeah, yeah, they're tough. Uh, TV's gotten really good. Yeah. Dalton's... <laughs> Dalton's relationship with Cliff is based on Burt Reynolds and Hal Needham, his longtime stunt double, who I think, what did he direct, Hooper? Smokey and the Bandit, right? And I mean, Smokey and the Bandit. He, he directed a lot of his late 70s movies. You know what movies. Smokey and the Bandit is? Yeah. That movie's incredible. Smokey and the Bandit rules. It's just Burt Reynolds in a car with Sally Field. She looks great. There's no plot. They're just driving across country. He's laughing. There's a truck behind them. I think there's... Is there a monkey in that one, or is that Clint Eastwood? That's Every Which Way But Loose. Every Which Way, yeah. Way. They should have merged those two movies. Let's, uh... <laughs> this is a good bit for you. Let's start merging movies. Smoking the Bandit with the ape from Every Which Way You Can. Yeah. It's an orangutan. Every Which Way That's Loose. orangutan. Yeah. That's a great movie. Clyde. How do you know it's an orangutan? I just know. That orangutan had a moment. Let's go with uh, categories. We have like about 15 rewatchable scenes. So what we do, if you don't know the, uh, the process here, we have categories to try to break down the movie and have fun with it and, uh, and 
through the categories, we dive in. It's like, it's like a big plate of mac and cheese, and you dive under, and there's like a cheesy part. So we're going to do that for you right now. Wait, what? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. The altitude's really getting me. It's been a, been a rough weekend. Uh, first one, this, I don't have this for me personally, but you guys both have it. Pacino at Musso and Franks telling Leo his career is basically over. Why is this a rewatchable scene for you? Um, I think it's actually Pacino's sequel performance from Heat. He's kind of doing... Gina, Gina, Gina! <laughs> I told you when we hooked up, baby! Yeah, he's good in this, man. He's kind of turning it up, yeah. you know? This is also Pacino's character in this movie. I, Sean has said this, and I hope you don't mind me mentioning this to a couple hundred of our closest friends. That what Pacino does that night where he has, like, brandy and watches movies alone is like, Sean's like, that sounds like heaven. That's my dream. Yeah. That guy goes into a screening room with his wife, who's like, what I want to do is watch movies all night. He pours many drinks and just watches the movies, and then the next day he calls a famous person and says, let's go to Musso and Frank. That's a fucking awesome life. That's you 15 years from now. I think Pacino rolled off the set of The Irishman as Jimmy Hoffa and is like, should I tweak the character? Nah. Yeah. <laughs> nah, same character. I'll just change. Can you change my wig for this? Great. Okay, I'm good. The thing that's cool about the character, though, is he's basically playing a version of Dino De Laurentiis, very famous Hollywood producer who started out in spaghetti westerns, yeah. who basically handpicked guys like Burt Reynolds and guys like Telly Savalas to come to Italy to make movies. And that's what that whole sequence is based on. And he used that spiel on those guys, and those producers used that spiel. They were like, do you really want to be heavy number two on this on the man from uncle for the rest of your career or do you want to be a movie star again i can make you a movie star again. that speech he gives is pure tarantino like that is not that much different than the actual speech tarantino get, gives in sleep with me when he's talking about top gun like nobody really thinks about movies the way he quite does i gave the same speech to chris in 2015 that's right remember, I do remember. it changed both of our lives <laughs> next scene rewatchable i don't know <laughs> I don't know. I told you the altitude. You guys are in for a ride tonight. I'm like barely here. Uh, Rick and Cliff leaving the restaurant post Pacino in the parking lot. Where he's crying and puts This is my first super rewatchable where he goes, It's official, old buddy. I'm a has been. <laughs> and does the whole thing. And he does the whole, when you come to face to face with the failure of your career. Five years of an ascent, now it's a race to the bottom. <laughs> All of it, Leo. I gotta do Frank. fucking Italian movies. <laughs> so good. Um, leading to them in the car and Brad Pitt driving and seeing the hitchhiker and Tarantino throws at Mrs. Robinson. It's a great five minutes. And that was like where you're like, oh, this is cool. Brad and Leo are in the same movie. Um, also, within good. five minutes, sets up the whole crisis in the movie. Yeah. That's yeah. the whole driving energy is Rick's falling apart. Yeah. I'm throwing this in as a rewatchable just because I love everything about how he filmed it. The Van Nuys drive-in. They don't have drive-ins anymore. You don't have to throw it in. It's okay. locked in. Yeah. Pitt going to the trailer. His weird dog that's been there for 12 hours who's <laughs> ready to kill some Manson family members later. Brandy. Uh, he's got TV guide. He's got the world's shittiest TV. It's a mess. He's got I don't know where the dog was. Yeah. Did, did somebody come and walk the dog, you think? Yeah, I'm sure he has a dog walk. Like a movie, the <laughs> movie usher at the Van Nuys drive -in? Or is that dog I think just dogs there? were just made of stronger stuff back then. You think they're, they're, yeah. Yeah. Late 60s dogs were like, hey, I'll see you when I see yeah. you. Yeah. Don't worry about it. I don't need to go to the bathroom. I'm fine. So it's like, I don't, I don't need like Xanax. I don't need like a, you know, a dog therapist. You can just leave me and I'll, I'll find something to eat. Do, would you be okay with that dog on a plane, Bill? I would not. <laughs> uh, not be okay with that. Uh, the dog food, some good close-ups of the old school 1960s Yeah, wolf's tooth. <laughs> Rat flavor. Brad Pitt. I, when you talk about like charisma and leading actors, like it's basically him in this tiny trailer for five minutes, and he makes it work. It's not a scene that should work and be so captivating. Every touch he puts in the trailer, Tarantino, is so meticulously thought out. I, I just I like that scene. He yeah. does one really funny thing, which they do later in the movie, which is he's, I think he's watching The Man from U.N.C.L.E., and there's a scene between two characters, and they're saying, you know, they're talking to each other, and she, the woman says, "You can't do that, sir." And then Pitt's character is like, "Yeah, you can." <laughs> Just like sitting in his trailer alone, talking to the television like a sociopath. But like that's what people do. The uh, next one is the Bruce Lee scene, which is also controversial. But uh, so I'm I'm making an executive move here because they cut away from it. He goes on the roof and takes off his shirt. And in the theater, there was murmuring and jostling in the theater. <laughs> when he takes off the shirt, the guys were like, oh, man, not bad, Brad Pitt. 
and other people were jostling that. We're not the guys. Um, but it's basically, he just breaks it out. He's like, I'm still fucking Brad Pitt. He doesn't break it out. He breaks it out. <laughs> takes the t-shirt off. He takes no a shirt off. for the shirt to come off. Okay. He's like, I'm Brad Pitt. Yeah. In case you guys forgot. I'm still the guy from Thelma and Louise. I'm a little older. I'm still strong. And then I'm still strong. <laughs> fix it. Great. That was your takeaway on that one? Fixing the antenna for no real reason. <laughs> and then just having a flashback to the time he fought Bruce Lee, which is probably super exaggerated. I doubt that that unfolded the way. There's a telltale sign that it's incredibly exaggerated and that he's not a reliable narrator, which is they have their fight and he throws him into the car and then they go hand to hand combat and then Zoe Bell's character comes out and the perspective on the frame changes and you see that all of the people that were surrounding the fight have disappeared. There's no one else in the room. Yeah. And you can tell that he's, it's all a false memory. He has imagined that he kicked Bruce Lee's ass once, which he probably did not. And there was obviously a lot of outrage about this scene because it seems disrespectful to Bruce Lee, but I honestly think the purpose of that scene is to show us that we can't trust Cliff. Yeah, that Cliff's kind of punch drunk and is like thinking about like, yeah, remember that time I fucked up Bruce Lee? That was amazing. I'll smoke a cigarette and fix this guy's antenna exactly. now. Exactly. Yeah. And one of the reasons, unfortunately, we love Brad Pitt so much and we think he's so cool that we want to believe Cliff. We want to believe he's good and decent. And yeah, he could beat up Bruce Lee, but that's not the point of the scene. This is why I was so crazy when there was an outrage about this scene. This is a wife-killing stuntman on a fucking roof, <laughs> drinking, who's you know, been whatever for the but last one years. He does parkour years. to get up to the roof. Like, he still has moves. That is pretty true. Yeah. And he just has this crazy memory of this Bruce Lee fight that definitely never happened. Where Bruce Lee is this huge, arrogant asshole, and Cliff has to put him in his place. Like, there's no way this happened. And people are like, man, that's disrespectful for Bruce Lee. It's like, all right. Well. I personally also don't think Bruce Lee being overconfident is an insult to Bruce Lee. <laughs> Bruce Lee was overconfident. Right. That's part of what made him a great artist and a great athlete. It's cool that he's overconfident. I just saw the Bruce Lee documentary, and he's a confident dude. But I love that scene, the dent in the blue car. Cliff amused watching Bruce just rant about how he could kick Muhammad Ali's butt and, and the way he handles that. And he's just ready to go, takes his tux off. His wig. Love great stuff. Takes, takes wig his off. wig off. That's great. Uh, next one. Sharon going to watch her own Mooney yeah. uh, movie, which comes off a washed up cliff scene where it, this starts like when she picks up the hitchhiker, which I like because it's a nice touch. Just it's just what it was like before, it's the 60s. like yeah. before Manson, really. It's yeah. great to know you. All right, we'll see you later. This is also like just you. You mentioned this a couple of times, but like like every scene of driving in this movie is the most rewatchable scene. Like every scene where people are just driving around, listening to the radio, it's pretty much. This and Days of Confused are like my two favorite driving around movies. Driving around in LA in 2020 is not the same no. as it is in this movie. I have a, a Honda and I sit in traffic and I listen to Bill. That's, that's what you, driving around in LA yeah. in 2020 is. You're, you're stopped at a stop like going, is that person dead? <laughs> What's going on there? Um, you, 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 you did skip a scene. Yeah, he always does. Well, you, we'll go. You, you want me to wait? After I'm done. You're in charge, Bill. You're free to come in. Okay. I love the old Fox lot. I love the uh, what if I'm in the movie. I like that they used the real Sharon Tate. In the, I thought that was a really crew, good yeah. decision. It yeah. was cool that they did that because she was great. And she was somebody who I think would have had a pretty big career and got, you know, and then she just gets thrown in the Manson family story for the rest of her life, but was a really yeah. up and comer. Um, Tarantino said that that idea of having her watch her own movie came from an experience he had after True Romance came out. He went to a theater. He was on a date at the Bruin, right? And convinced the employees that he wrote the script and can I get in and did the whole thing. But I think she's phenomenal in that movie. And she got nominated for an Oscar for Bombshell, which is a pretty forgettable movie. And I, I thought she, I thought this was the movie. So it all worked out. She got nominated anyway, but I thought this was the movie. What do you think of that scene? I think everything that he does with her is really, really smart. I mean, he said something when he accepted, I think, one of the Golden Globes where he said she was, she brought the most goodness to any of his movies, which is not really something that you think about. His movies are not decent. They're actually, like, purposefully indecent. Yeah. They're kind of gnarly and twisted, and you're meant to walk out feeling a little gross, but exhilarated, but gross. And she brings something 
very pure. It's not movie. like you're like pulling for Jennifer Jason Lee and hatefully. Uh, no, she's yeah. bad. Yeah, yeah. Like, they're all they're all on. literally hateful. Easy, you got it. You know, like yeah. no, no. Yeah. So she br- she brings like a like a literally a decent essence to the whole movie, and she's she's a great actress. She's already she's gonna win an Oscar in the next ten years anyway. I bought a ton of stock with, in her after Focus. I think I'm the only one that likes Focus. Anyone else? <laughs> Kind of a quietly incredible Will Smith movie. So you waited until after Wolf of Wall Street. You were like, not this one. I'm focus going, was, Focus. Yeah. Focus was one. before. Focus was first. No. Are you sure? Yeah. Don't try him tonight. He's really sharp. Can someone look this up? <laughs> focus was after? Yeah. Well, that's when I bought my stock. <laughs> <laughs> not going to apologize. Bill, yeah. can I interest you in some Apple stock? Yeah. <laughs> Focus is amazing. What was your scene that we skipped? Um, Cliff, or excuse me, Rick, practicing his lines at his house in his pool. Oh, yeah. Making no, I drinks. Had that, I'm sorry, I have that out of sequence. All That's right, just, talk about that scene. I just, it's just really funny. And I had never really thought that I'm not an actor. I don't know anything about acting, honestly. I never thought that that's what you would do, but just record the lines set up the recorder, and then get into your pool and float around and, and read your lines. I just thought that was Do we genius. know what the drink was he was making? Oh, whiskey sour. Whiskey sour. That's right, yeah. Yeah, eight fucking whiskey sours. Cliff, because I didn't know there was an egg in a whiskey sour. In his. <laughs> Cliff picks up the hitchhiker is an amazing five minutes, and that's Andy McDowell's daughter, which yeah. I didn't realize when I saw the movie. Margaret Qualley, yeah. Just made me feel like I'm 100 years old. Uh, <laughs> that whole scene is great, and the tension with them, that character, she's really good. Mm-hmm. Definitely a breakout. She'll be coming up later in a couple of different categories, but... Uh, and it has a lot of driving around, which Chris loves. And more importantly, phenomenal Neil Diamond song. Great one. Who knew that they could scrape the Neil Diamond archives and, and still find like an yeah. awesome... I mean, the music in this movie is just uh, superb. Yeah. I think it might be his best soundtrack. Rick's freak out when, when uh, he completely loses his mind. I have in the sequence here, even though it happened earlier. I just wanted to point In the point. trailer? In the trailer. The freak out. It's gonna win this category. Yeah. Okay. This it's is also like, all improvised. It's not written. This was all Leo's idea, which he brought to Quentin, and they decided it would be a good idea. Did you guys talk it. about this on a leg day when you were just like <laughs> next to each other? It's like all that stuff was me, Sean, and you were like, "Oh, that's amazing, Leo." Is that you guys? No. Okay. <laughs> I set myself up for this. Like an uh, asshole. Cousin of that scene, the I'm Rick fucking Dalton scene, when he pulls off his big acting scene, which we should mention. I have for my, well, I, I don't want to give it away, but Cliff going to the Spawn Ranch, mm-hmm. which I think, when you see it the second time and the third time, you know it's going to happen. It loses its effect a little bit. In the theater the first time, it felt He's like the die. whole movie is, uh, yeah. is building up to it. I thought, so, he, was, I thought he was going to die in that scene. It's some like research yeah. on this one, Tarantino wanted it to look like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Yeah. And had his crew research Texas Chain and the whole feel of it and how desolate it was. And then the other influence was Apocalypse Now, the Duval helicopter scene, how the helicopters are just kind of constantly there making you a little disoriented. He wanted the dogs to be the helicopters. So when you watch this scene again, the dogs are just always around and just kind of not out of control, but involved and making you uncomfortable. And like Duval, Cliff is unflappable. You know, he doesn't blink, he doesn't twitch, he just stays focused on going to see Spawn. The, the, the family turns on him near the end, it gets dark quick. They do. I, I saw this entire movie in the theater and didn't realize that was Lena Dunham. Didn't realize till after. How could you not realize? I, that I don't know. I was had so, the opposite experience. She wasn't wearing like a fake nose. I was Lena so Dunham. fearful for Cliff, I didn't even know who else was in the scene. I, it took me right out of the movie, honestly. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, I think she's good. It's not that she's not good in the scene. Yeah. It's just I was like, all this why like is the, the stunt <laughs> casting with the Manson family is a little bit it throws you off a little bit sometimes. And then uh, the last one, unless you guys have others, when the uh, Manson family shows up, Pitt has smoked an acid laced <laughs> cigarette or joint. What was it? Cigarette, I think. And then uh, mm. he's basically Floyd from True Romance for the first two minutes of that scene, and then it turns into an awesome action scene. And, and the irony of it is. Cliff, the stuntman, does all the work, basically kills these three people, but Rick gets all the credit at the end, which is just like a movie. What happened to Rick and Trudy? Yeah, man. Julia Butters. You can put that in. That's not on your list? Honorable mention. I picked 10 scenes. Okay. This is a good movie. For 10 hours. Uh, Rick and Trudy. Uh, You got to also just have the entire Rolling Stones out of time sequence. 
with the lights coming on. Okay. Yeah. So what's the most rewatchable scene? It's Leo blowing his lines and being in his trailer and freaking out. It's also just like that whole sequence with Oliphant where he's just like, line! Woo! <laughs> like, it's just so good. <laughs> he's like Ric Flair. It's like amazing. Yeah. So about 30 minutes ago in the green room upstairs, Chris was like, literally like, don't fucking embarrass yourself out there. <laughs> just freaking out. And Bill had to pep talk him and get him, get him clear. I'm he's going good with, now, I'm going with Cliff on the Roof and the Bruce Lee scene. Really? Yeah, because when I rewatched it the third time, I look forward to that scene the most. Yeah. So that's how I'm judging this. All right, next category. What's already aged the best? We can't do what's aged the best because this movie came out five months ago. What's already aged the best? Rick Dalton's house. It was for sale on, like, and I looked at it on Zillow you and I was really You tell everybody about how close you get to almost buying movie houses. It's never actually. But he's, he has sent us so many links to the Boogie Nights house where he's like, the price is looking pretty soft today. But, but it's not like, he's not like, I'm going to buy this for me as a man. Oh, no, he wants, He's like, we're moving the ringer to yeah, the boogie night. We're moving house. the ringer to the deep valley. Which is, it's in West To work Pulvina, in the porn murder house. A hundred yeah. minutes from where I live. Yeah. <laughs> and he would just be like, the first thing he would do would be like, I'm not coming in today. But then like the next, <laughs> like we would all be stuck there. All this with is Alfred true. With Alfred Molina, Yeah. So the Boogie Nights house was for sale for four or five months, and they dropped the price a couple times. And at one point, I just did ways and tried to figure out exactly how far away it was from our office. And it was like 10 minutes too far. But we were thinking, like, we, we could film our Ringer videos by the pool. Cool. In the Boogie Nights scene. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Super cool. Rick Dalton's shoot, house. Jack. <laughs> Rick Dalton's house, uh, amazing. The dog. Randy. Yeah. Randy. He's, he's aged the best. So we had on unha- she. What? Why is Brandy a he? Oh, I thought it was Randy. Oh, it's a she? Randy. Randy is, is Kurt Russell. Russell, yeah. Um, we, we did a hottest take. I forget who did it. About one of the Oscars categories should be best performance by a pet. <laughs> Which would actually be, if you think about what the did Oscars Did we really are, do that? Yeah, I thought we did, or it's in the. I thought maybe that was I'm an spoiling Aaron it. <laughs> Wasn't that an Aaron Sorkin take? Where he's like, that horse from War Horse should have won Maybe that's what it was. I told you that. That was so weird when he said that. That's what it was. It was so weird. That's what it was. He was not kidding. He was like, that was one hell of a horse. We think. (laughs) (laughs) You think about it, you look at the Oscars and you look at, like, I don't know, 1990, the 1994 Oscars, and you're like, oh, that was the year Forrest Gump and Shawshank and Pulp Fiction. Where are the pets? Maybe this, maybe we should have, or it should at least be a little special award the day before when they do like the technical and all that crap. Yeah, uh, I'm in the dog Oscars. I mentioned Neil Diamond. How they recreated 1969 Hollywood. One of the things I love about this movie is I love being at a movie where I'm just like, how the fuck did they do that? And there's a lot of those moments where they're driving down Sunset and you're just like, how the fuck did they do that? Yeah, how did it- they completely change? the horrible highway that I go on every once in a while and make it seem like a fun place. There's a lot of the signage that you see when you're like seeing all the stuff on Hollywood Boulevard and on Sunset Boulevard. Like They literally like redid it. It wasn't like, oh, that's cool. You just have to like change a light bulb. They had to like reconstruct a lot of the neon signs out there. It was just amazing. And, so, and some of them kept the signs, I think. A couple of the, couple of the stores. They were like, we're good. We'll, we'll keep this. All, all the production design and the costumes in the movie are incredible. Are yeah. they going to win for this? Is that a category? That, the, um, that they're favored for? I don't. The 1917 wave is strong, man. I don't know. Oh, Jesus, fucking World War One. Give me a break. <laughs> Over a hundred years ago. Actually, there My there is a, one funny story about that that I heard, which is that you know at the beginning of the movie when it's there's like a very slow pan out and you realize you're in his driveway and you see this this painting of Rick. And you're like, what is that? It's very similar to the beginning of Hateful Eight, where there's this very slow pan out and it's like a Jesus Christ statue. And I, that painting is weird. It's like, why, if, why would you have a painting of yourself in your own driveway? I asked Quentin about it, and he was like, I was scouting for the movie, and I went to this house in Tarzana that I thought could be Rick's house. And I get to the house, and I learned that the house was Lee Van Cleef's house, who was one of his favorite actors from yeah. The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, very famous spaghetti western actor. And he told this story of going into Lee Van Cleef's house, which is basically a Lee Van Cleef museum. He meets his widow. They're hanging out, and then he goes into his garage, and in his garage is a giant painting of Lee Van Cleef, 
And he was like, this is fucking weird that this guy has a painting of himself in his garage. <laughs> and he was like, that's why I put a painting of Rick, Rick in the yeah. driveway. And like, that's a very weird, purposeful choice for the movie to say like, somebody probably saw a poster of Rick somewhere for a movie. And they were like, hey man, I saw this poster of you and I bought it and I want to give it to you. And he's like, what am I going to do with this? I guess I'll just put it in my driveway. <laughs> you know, like, right. There's a lot of very purposeful stuff going on in the movie that is really smart. Rick remembering when he almost got the McQueen movie and he says, me and the three Georges were up for it. Yeah. I just really enjoyed it. I that. would say you could, you could add into that like the accumulated works of, of Rick Dalton. Like all of like the, the Bounty Law stuff, the FBI episode, those, the Italian, the Spaghetti Westerns, this Operation Dynamite, like all that stuff is just so inventive and imaginative. Yeah, he's definitely on Fantasy Island in like 1979, like right before he dies of lung cancer. Yeah, Quinn does like in the, in the interview he did with Kim Morgan for the new Beverly, he basically like plots out Quinn's yeah. like whole 70s or Rick Dalton's whole 70s. I think that's why he wanted to make the movie too, was like an ode to those Maris guys. and Jacaris yeah. and Fabian and Ed Burns and all these guys who like were maybe gonna be Steve McQueen but then didn't get a chance to be. More what's aged the best, the Playboy Mansion, which is the actual Playboy Mansion, which I didn't realize. I thought they faked it, but that actually really was it. A aged the best, like in terms of architecture? Or? No, it was just cool seeing it. Okay. Um, <laughs> Would you say the sexual politics no, of the Playboy yeah, Mansion yeah. has aged well? It's like, hey, the, no, <laughs> enjoyed seeing the mansion. <laughs> Hadn't thought about the it. Grotto. Uh, Roman Polanski dresses like Austin Powers yeah. when he goes to the Playboy so Mansion. So good. Which I fucking love. So good. It's like, yeah, baby. Uh, I love Bounty Law. 1960s airplanes. Sure. With the two Bloody floors. Bloody Mary's and, cigarettes, yeah. God, why can't we go back? What happened? What happened to two floor airplanes with no dogs? And cigarettes. <laughs> have either of you guys ever danced on an airplane? You can have the dogs. I've never, I never have. You've no. never danced on an airplane? No. no? Have Bill? You, have you ever danced on an airplane? Every time I fly. Um, El Coyote, which has not changed Still at all. It. How's it aged? Like, have you eaten at El Coyote recently? Well, the food has not aged the best. Yeah. <laughs> that is a margaritas and uh, nachos place, and that's it. Uh, I like, we forgot to, when Pacino's laying into him, and he says, so Rick, who's going to kick the shit out of you next week? Mannix? The man from Uncle? The girl from Uncle? Uh, Boom, bang, bang, down goes you, down goes your career as a leading man. That whole speech is great. Uh, Rick's Italian movies, the posters would be funny. They'd be on eBay. Nebraska Jim. Yeah, all that stuff. <laughs> and uh, I mentioned Fat Leo. And then the extended cast. Just a lot of randos from our lives, especially sure. my life, because I love a lot of these people. Michael Madsen, Luke Perry, Pacino, Kurt Russell, Emil Hirsch, Oliphant, Liam Dunham, like... Uh, it's definitely one of the. Is this the most eclectic cast that he's had? I mean, it's it's like pouring out of like uh, like it's like off the shelf. It's like every yeah. single person you're like, oh my god, there's like yeah, and the people who are he got cut out of the movie like don't like, we, oh, yeah, that's I'm a sorry. big one. Well, all the, I mean, all the actresses who play the Manson family are all the daughters internet of, famous yeah. or scions of famous families. Like Kevin or, Smith's daughter, Ethan Hawke's daughter, yeah. But and then I mean, Clifton Collinson's movie, Scoot McNary, like so many people whose business faces Bob. You know, and then uh, last, what's age the best for me is that just the title, the trick of the title, and not realizing that the title is setting you up for everybody not dying. It's very good movie. Yeah, it's because when I was in the theater, I, th I don't know about you guys, but I thought everybody was gonna get killed at the end, and I couldn't figure out the tone of the movie. And now at the end, I'm gonna watch everybody get murdered in uh, in Sharon Tate's house. But then the dot 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 in the title. Mm. I remember the when they're when he goes to Rome, and then that sequence is really short. And you're like two hours and 15 minutes into the movie, and you're like, what's going on? Is, like, is this not the Manson movie? Yeah. Like, you kind of got disoriented by the end, and you don't realize when they get back to the house that, that it's going to be get one night. Yeah. yeah. Right. What do you have for what stage is the best? Anything else? I have like uh, just the sensation of moving through your life with a radio or a TV on all day. Like, because like, for most of the, especially the first two days, like you're just constantly hearing the the radio in the background, being like Sirian, Sirian, or or just playing music, and then uh, the way they just like flip the TV on, and that, like I think that's a very relatable feeling. It's like that constant nightlight feeling of of like media like that. Yeah, and there's like all those commercials that are all authentic. He listened to like uh, I think 16 hours of KHJ real radio broadcast. That stuff is like on YouTube. You can listen to like right. like hours and hours of those shows. I would also say that the the three day structure is incredible. Like just when you watch it and you realize like what you get to see because he's sticking so so much to just like I'm gonna show you three days in these people's lives that change them. It's it's awesome. 
So I'm going for what stage is the best, how he redid 1969 Hollywood, because that jumps out at me every time I watch it. I don't know about you guys. What's your pick? I, I like the music and the kind of constant soundtrack of the movie. Yeah, I'm going to go with that. Okay. Uh, what's already... I have two different what's age the worst. This is what's already age the worst. Um, now, bear with me. This is going to be confusing. The shock value of the murders not happening with Sharon Tate and all that, it, that only really works one time as a gimmick when you watch this movie. When you're rewatching it, you know it's going to happen. So it's like a lot of great movies have that where the big reveal, the big surprise... That one is like the first time it hits you, second time you don't think about it because you know it's going to happen. Uh, all right, it's time. Damien Lillis. <laughs> Damien, Damien, what do you mean it's time? Like we knew this was coming? Did he die? A lot of people have been talking about Damien Lewis. It's his time and what's already aged the worst. <laughs> Damien Lewis as, as Steve, Steve McQueen... McQueen. But he's also Axe from Billions and Brody from Homeland and has all the baggage from those two guys. And it's like, that's not Steve McQueen. I'm sorry. I just can't, I can't go there. Uh, him ogling Sharon Tate, I just, I just wasn't buying it. You're not with me? Why are you staring at me like I just took my head off? No, because I, I think that that was like not one of the top 100 things I would have thought you would have said just there. But yeah, it's, uh, he's not good. Yeah. I, I agree. He's not good. It's he's it, he's miscast. It's one of the only things in the movie I don't like. And it's also like weird, like the like even the way his character is written, where he's like that there is Sharon Tate, and that's Roman Polanski, and that's like it's like a very Mister Exposition character. It's it's funny. I think if you were Steve McQueen at the Playboy Mansion, you would not be sitting on the sidelines looking at what other people are doing. Yeah, You'd be at the Playboy. Just be like, Mansion. damn, I'm so lonely. I'm Steve McQueen. I had this in nitpicks, but I'll just do it now. Yeah, he could have probably made a run at at Sharon Tate, right? Roman Polanski was like 5'2". But she, I think he, he says that's her type. You want me to officially weigh in on if I Steve, Steve McQueen, McQueen made a run at Sharon Steve Tate? Steve McQueen's just sadly sitting like on the side like some loser. He can't get Sharon Tate. I don't know. I'm not buying it. Like he was the biggest star in the world. But she has a type. Has a like type. They explain yeah. it. I liked that, actually. No. Okay. Um, <laughs> the Spawn Ranch scene we mentioned peaked the first time. It's never the same after when you know it's going to happen. Anything else already edged the worst for you guys? I had Spawn. Okay. I mean, we kind of already did. I just, yeah, we did that. The, the takes, the takes aged bad. Um, what might age the worst? I the the Bruce Lee thing. I don't know if that will still go or not. People love Bruce Lee. They don't like any. You know, there's Bruce Lee super fans. So I don't know if that goes away. I I, I honestly, the way I explained it is how I understand. Yeah, it. I'm fine with it too. Casting what ifs. A lot of them. Bruce Stern's character. Uh, was not the first choice. Bruce Stern was not the first choice. First choice was Burt Reynolds, who died. During rehearsals. Could not be in the movie because he died. Uh, is this better or worse with Burt Reynolds? Old, I mean, we're talking old Burt Reynolds at this point. Dern's pretty good. I'm fine with Dern. I'm not that I'm trying to I kind of like Burt it more. Reynolds, like. Well, it's a better touch because Burt Reynolds was almost a Rick Dalton. Like that's as a as a note in the movie, Bruce Dern wasn't a Rick Dalton. Bruce Dern was always the bad guy in the Western. Always. Yes. So Well, I have I have my choice for who it should have been coming up later. Um Tim Roth cut from the movie. Yep. James Marsden, ringer favorite, cut from the movie. So Tim Roth was supposed to play JC Brings Butler, and then uh James Marsden was supposed to play Burt Reynolds. You can no. see James Marsden in a, in a deleted scene playing Burt Reynolds. He does not look or sound like Burt Reynolds. <laughs> there you go. Tarantino originally approached for Sharon Tate. Jennifer Lawrence. J-Law. Oh, wow. Oh. Wow. Ooh. Damn. Hot crowd. <laughs> Jesus. More than Woke the crowd up. Yeah. My Lord. Yeah, I don't think that would have worked. I agree. Uh, Tarantino wrote the role of Marvin specifically for Al Pacino. We did the three rewatchables with him. We were asking him about his process when he writes roles. And sometimes he writes the role and then figures out the actor after. And sometimes he says, I am writing this part for this actor and I hope he'll take it. And I think that was the case. Any other uh, casting what ifs? I mean, there was a lot of stories about this movie as it was starting to be developed and as the screenplay was starting to be read, even if it was just like a rumor that an actor had gone to read for it. So there was like a point where Deadline had been like reporting that Samuel L. Jackson was going to have like a major role in this movie. Obviously, I don't know what that could have possibly been. Uh, there was also, I think Tom Cruise was originally thought of for Cliff, right? 
It's been discussed. Yeah. I don't know how much of that can be talked about. I think, about. look, is it fair to say Tarantino has a Cruz fetish? Like he's <laughs> wants to work with him at some point. I could see Cruz in the 10th movie. What do you mean by fetish? I think he likes him. I think he wants to work with him. He mentioned him in the pods we did with him. And I think he's surfaced a couple times in Tarantino movies. Yeah, I don't know how like legitimate this was. This is like kind of like internet gossip, but it was like that Cruise was up like in in the mix. We could do a whole podcast of all the movies that Tom Cruise was up for that would have been a disaster had he done them. Yeah. And I think this is uh, one of them. Hey, new category because we passed 100 rewatchables episodes. It's not a new category. This is the first we're hearing about this. There's no, we a, this is, we, there's a new category? No, it's not new. It's renamed. Okay. Oh. It used to be the, initially it was the Mark Ruffalo, they knew! Yes. For overacting. Then Stahl Rubinek, they stabbed me in the heart! And then uh, Linda Partridge, they knew, uh, what was her thing? Don't call me lady! Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have uh, renamed it for Vincent Hanna. Give me all you got! Yeah. Give me all you got! Overacting award. Did you guys So this, this is the overacting award. On reheat, yeah. You didn't hear that? I haven't listened to reheat. Yeah, we didn't invite you. We didn't invite you to that one. I'm fired. Just too busy doing tricep. Leo, just like getting, getting fit. So my two nominees are the guy who played Bruce Lee, because I thought he really dialed it up. Mike Moe. Or Manson family lady after her face was shattered. Yeah. Which is like... <laughs> for like five minutes. Uh, just had like a gun seizure. I don't know what's going on there, but... At no point they asked, they never asked her to do another take, and she just kind of went with it, and I don't know what happened. So yeah, those are my I, two nominees. I, that, it didn't leap out. I wasn't like, man, she's really overdoing it here. When she gets her face knocked off and then gets flamethrowered, I wasn't like, man, dial it down. A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start at one. Fair. Get the makeup off. Come on, no, we got to reset. So you're going with Bruce Lee. Uh, Anyone else? I actually have. I actually think her overacting is when she's in the car. Yeah. Which is like, I got an idea, man. Yeah. You know, doing that whole thing. Sorry, I didn't watch any fucking fascist on television, man. Yeah. Yeah. That's more, when she gets yeah. hit in the face with dog food, that's understandable. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> any other any other nominees? Let's give it to her anyway. Well, I... Are you going to give it to Leo for the, no. the trailer scene? No, no, no. That's good. Uh, I think Zoe Bell's kind of going, she's going a little hard. Fair. Screaming it at, at Pitt. I think that scene... She, <laughs> <laughs> Shades uh, of your Robert Shaw in Jaws. You. <laughs> <laughs> uh, best that guy, aka the Joey Pants Award. There's like 105 of these people. We each had a nominee. Your nominee was? Uh, I'll just go James Raymar as Ugly Owl Hoot on Bow Bounty Law. You may know him from 48 Hours. I thought hours. you were going with Clifton Collins. Oh, yeah. Clifton Collins is the, the vaquero. Well, just for, to be fair, James Remar, he's James Remar. Yeah. Me. Because okay. he was Gans in 48 Hours, and he was Ajax in The Warriors. He's in The, war the, the Warriors. Yeah. He's yeah. also in I, Sex in the City. Classic, you yeah. uh, know? Solo pod for you? Sean, who'd you have? Uh, there's a lot. Rebecca Gayhart. Just pick one. Damon Harriman from Justified. Yeah. I thought you had Clue Gulliger. Clue Gulliger? Yeah, Clue Gulliger, who's the bookstore owner, who sells uh, her the copy of Test Ubervilles, who was the star of like the Virginian and a bunch of Westerns in the 60s. I just want to let you guys know I did a lot of research on Test Ubervilles that I'm not going to use tonight. Didn't Thank you. Out. Yeah, it was just like a dead end. I have Dan such a generous podcaster. I have Danielle Harris, the little girl from Halloween Four and Last Boy Scout, who's now is a grown up Manson family lady in this movie. QT loves Halloween Four. Yeah, big fan. So there you go. I don't know who wins on that. Who are we gonna give it to? Should we give it to James? Let's give it to Remar. Okay. Yeah. The Deanne Waiters Award. I only have one nominee for this. I, Margaret Qualley is Pussycat the Hitchhiker. I thought she. She's only in like four scenes. She crushes it. She's super memorable, every single frame. And I thought I was a star making performance, so I go for her. I gotta go uh, Nicholas Ham Hammond to Sam was... Wanamaker. Give me evil Hamlet! You know, like I love that. Dark Hamlet! Yeah. I don't, I don't, what does he say? He's like, I want Caleb! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> vroom, vroom! <laughs> All that stuff is great. Uh, there's, a, there's more, right? Like Lorenza Izzo, who plays Francesca Capucci. Yeah. Oh, yeah. His new wife. Austin Butler is Tex Watson. Yeah, he's great. He's Austin good. Butler, who's about to be Elvis Presley in a Baz Luhrmann movie. That guy's about to be really, really famous. Oh, man. The guy who plays Tex Watson. He's good in this movie. Yeah. I agree. Uh, recasting Couch. If you could recast one part in the movie, what would you do? He wouldn't have done it, but Jack Nicholson in the Bruce Dern part would have been amazing. Yeah, that would have been awesome. Ooh. That's a yeah. great, great call. I you, know what? you still got it. 
Thanks, CR. Appreciate it. He just said Jack Nicholson. <laughs> uh, I wanted to play a game with you about this. Yeah. So if, if not Brad and Leo, then who? Oh, like Ben and Matt. Well. <laughs> Height difference. I had, what about Johnny Depp and Robert Downey Jr.? Wow. Wait, I, I forgot to check my cancel standings. Is Depp canceled? I can't remember. I honestly can't remember. I think he's just, he's, yeah. He's in hiatus? I'm just gonna pass on this one. <laughs> Is it, I thought Depp was like, nobody wanted to work with him anymore. I'm just saying in the imaginary world of this podcast where I say something and you respond to it. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> Would they have been good together in the part? So I think this works because they're about the same physical build yeah. and they look just enough alike that it works. And I think it would have been really, I don't even know where to go with two A-listers. Jude Law and Matt Damon? Get the talented Mr. Ripley crew back together? That's nice. I like not that. Not bad. Got another one for you. I did. That's not bad. I would not, like to I, see it. I, I, would, I would, honestly, if they wanted to remake this movie doing that, I would watch it. I had that I in unanswerable it. questions. You want to do that now? If they flip the movie? Sure. I don't think it's as good, because I, I don't think Leo would have been quite as good in the cliff part. He's pretty stoic, though. I think he could do it. Not as physically imposed. Yeah, I don't think he's... He, not since Peloton started between he and I. What if, it's, what if they flip it, but Leo has to wear his J. Edgar makeup the whole time? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, one, one, one Jake Gyllenhaal and Gerard Butler? Jake Gyllenhaal and Gerard Butler? <laughs> We're just doing a podcast. Just that's, three guys doing a podcast. But like, that's not Jake Gyllenhaal's <laughs> doppelganger. Like, that's like, but it's not like when I see Gerard Butler, I'm like, God, that just looks like a swole Gyllenhaal. It's amazing. But you don't see his face. We're talking about physical bearing. He's like 30 years older than Jake Gyllenhaal, isn't <laughs> that's he? That's just not true. Butler? You think Butler's 85? <laughs> That movie's going right to Netflix. It's not even in the theater. Sarandos is like, I'm oh, in. Here's 30 million. Um, Downey and who? Because Downey was the one. I feel like he's on the on the Leo Pitt kind of level. Downey and Clooney. Too old. Yeah, I think Clooney's too old. It's well, like Clooney's six years. Pitch ago. an idea for Christ's sake. Yeah, I'm tearing everything down. I, I said Matt and Ben. I laughed at Gerard and Jake. I, I mean, I, I did. The part of the reason why this movie is a masterpiece is because he got it. Chris is impersonating the internet. He's offering no ideas and just shitting on everyone else's. <laughs> Thank you. Speaking of the internet, half-ass internet research. Brad Pitt had lived the line. You're Rick fucking Dalton. Don't you forget it. As a Brad Pitt original, uh, based it on an actor who told him the same thing when he was a budding actor in the early 90s. Like Did not Brad say who the Pitt? actor was. Who yeah. do you think the actor was? I have to think it was like Michael Madsen in I'd like to think it's, like, it's Rappaport in the, in the uh, in true romance. In true romance. Yeah. He's like, you're Brad fucking Pitt. <laughs> That's what good. if it was Saul Rubinick? That'd be great. Oh. Um, so a flashback shows Rick training to use a flamethrower and recoiling from the heat it generates, and it's funny. Uh, apparently that was Leo's genuine reaction to using like it. it's too hot? Yeah. And Tarantino thought it was hilarious and was like, that's going in the movie. <laughs> the Cadillac. Because he says, this is getting really, is there any way to turn the heat down on this? And they're like, it's a flamethrower. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Great laugh for you just saying the lines. No. <laughs> All I have to do is repeat Quentin Tarantino lines, apparently. <laughs> the Cadillac belonged to? Anyone know? Michael Madsen. Same Cadillac that appeared in Reservoir Dogs in 1992, driven oh, by Michael the Madsen. cops in the trunk? Yeah. It's amazing Michael Madsen hasn't He's sold this to He's kept that car like in amazing shape. I know. Hasn't been able to afford a new car. <laughs> oh, it might have been that, too. Tough pot for Low me. blow. Don't Sorry. kill me, Mr. Blonde. Uh, at El Coyote, Sharon Tate and J.C. Bring discussed the erotic movie theater premiere down the street at the E. Rose Theater which is now the new Beverly, owned by Quentin Tarantino. Oh. So there you go. Uh, framed issue of Mad Magazine available in uh, Dalton's apartment. You can see it. He told us this whole story, not on a podcast. He just he was when so he came excited in for about one of the pods, yeah. It, about uh, Mad Magazine actually made that as a full-length magazine that he had input on and had jokes from the 60s and his, 
this whole elaborate thing that this is why you got to love Tarantino. He just fucking goes for it with everything. Even if there's a Mad Magazine, he's like, I don't want the cover. Let's do 50 pages that nobody will yeah. see about Mad Magazine. Yeah. That's and let's make the jokes funny. His, like, the way he wrote this movie was he essentially like wrote, I think, a novelization that was before the screenplay that is, here is Cliff and Rick's entire life up into this movie. And then he like put the novel aside. I think he gave those to, to Brad and Leo. And then he wrote the screenplay from that. The Mal- every single thing is like, I know the answer to that question. The Maltese Falcon, which Sharon Tate holds in the bookstore, is now owned by Leo DiCaprio. Oh, is that, that the uh, offense? And he owned it before the movie and was like, hey, how about you could use my Maltese Falcon because I have the wow. only one. Because that's what you do when you make 20 million a year for like 30 years. <laughs> you buy the Maltese Falcon. Yeah. I'll have to ask him to show that to me next time I go to his house. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when you guys are leaving the Equinox. <laughs> um, Trudy was inspired by an actual character from Lancer uh-huh. that I have no idea why Tarantino was fascinated by Well, her. some people think it's sort of based on Jodie Foster. Maybe. Because she, was, she appeared on Gunsmoke and Westerns at that time, and she was obviously a really precocious actress, and she was famous for being highly professional on set. Yeah. And so there's some, some Jodie Foster in, in her character. Going to Apex Mountain. Tough one, because this movie just came out like a week ago. Uh, I will say post-prime Brad Pitt. I don't think this is prime bad Brad Pitt, but if you go post prime, this is what's Brad's apex? You think? Probably Moneyball. Apex Mountain that didn't make a, that didn't make a lot of lot money though. What would it be then? Ocean's Eleven, probably. Yeah. You think? Well, I mean, I think his apex might. Oh wait, hold on. Let's play this out. When does he start dating Jennifer? Oh, I thought you were gonna say, hold on. Let's start explaining what Apex Mountain. Is. No, no, no. We have people, nobody will ever figure it out. I think. It, I think. Uh, I you're think right. It is Ocean's Eleven. It's, it's it's Fight Club or Ocean's Eleven. Yeah. No, you're right. Because he's dating Jennifer Aniston. They're the biggest couple in the world. He's got Ocean's Eleven. They're making sequels. You're right. Okay. Bad call by me. 1960s dog food. Apex Mountain. <laughs> See those cans. Um, 1969. I was going to say... Really yeah. crazy year, including my, uh, my birth. Oh. Not mentioned. I mean, people do it in 1969. But uh, talk more a lot of shit birth? happened. Like what else, like your what beloved like? Mets won the World Series? Yeah, that's just rude to bring that up. Yeah. We landed on the moon? <laughs> yeah, that's true. It's like, uh, those are the top Woodstock? Three. Yeah. You want to just say more stuff that happened President in 69? President Nixon, year one? <laughs> a lot Coming of shit, up next! A lot yeah. of shit going on. <laughs> A lot of shit going on. You just turned into a Tom Hanks CNN documentary. No, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> that was a good joke. Uh, any other Apex Mountains for you? It's too early. Los Angeles movies? Best Los Angeles movie ever made? You just said Heat is your favorite movie of all time on a podcast. <laughs> that was a week ago. So we're just starting from zero now. I'm just saying. It's in the conversation, isn't it? Sure. This, uh, Heat, Boys in the Hood, Nightcrawler. Like what, like, what else? Gwen said Bob and Carol and Ted and Alice was a big influence on this movie, which I think came out in 69, and a lot of the characters and the looks that the characters have and the scenery and the setting is very Bob and Carol and Ted and Alice. That's also a great Ellie movie. Any predictions for Apex Mountain? Ten Why? years from now? Like, could this be Margot Robbie's Apex Mountain no, year right now? So. I hope not. No, no. I, hey! <laughs> having a conversation. Uh, well, I hope not, because I think she has better, better things in store. I hope it's not Julia Butters' Apex Mountain. I hope it's not Margaret Qualley's Apex Mountain. I hope it's... Do you think it's... I don't think we'll look back and think it's Pitt's Apex Mountain, but it's an interesting, no. we'll, it'll be interesting to gather here, all of us, in All right, we're almost done. Discuss. Picking nits. We picked a lot of nits already. Um, this is where Sean's going to get it. Sean hates when I... I'm not going to touch the third rail, but I'm going to go near it. Are we sure Cliff would be that afraid to get a blowjob from a hitchhiker that's not 18? <laughs> He's a wife-killing stuntman, and it's the 60s. Is he? What, he all of a sudden he has a moral compass. This is a. Cool, you don't have to answer, Sean. Very Just, cool. Very cool moment for for both of us here. I, <laughs> it was 19. Like Elvis married a 13-year-old. So the question is. <laughs> are we sure of Cliff Booth? definitely would turn down a blowjob in a car in that setting. In 1969? Not answering. <laughs> there you go. Uh, did we ever figure out why Cliff's dog never shit and pissed in the trailer? 
Like how many hours That's could a dog be in cut. one place? The extended cut, the dog is like the fourth character in the movie, yeah. Is it like a giant crate where dogs won't shit in their own crate and the trailer's just small enough that it Maybe feels like a Maybe there's a doggy door, we just don't see it. Any other nitpicks? No, actually, I, have very, I, I don't have anything for this movie. So you went we, teenager blowjob, dog shitting, and then you're, you're done. Well, cause, Do you have any nitpicks for this? Because... <laughs> I'm not sure if we're supposed to think Cliff's a good guy or not. I think no, we're, we, we're think not. he's not a good guy. Neither is he's Rick. He's a wife-killing stuntman. That's actually important, I think, about the movie is because we love Leo and Brad, we think they're the heroes of the movie. They're the main characters, but those, Rick in particular is an asshole. Like, he is a vain, selfish dick on the wrong side of his life. And that's the point of the movie. Yeah. yeah. You know? and, and Sharon is obviously the goodness, and she's the, th- the third part of the story, and she is the, you know, the, the good balancing out the evil in the history of Hollywood. And I think Quentin has a lot of admiration for those guys, those kinds of actors, but I don't think at any time you're supposed to think those guys are like good guys. Yeah, and I think that the theme of the movie, it's funny because it's like, when you watch Tarantino movies, it's like, I think if we asked, if you asked every single person in this room, they would have like a different interpretation about what Pulp Fiction was like about, if it's about anything in particular. But I think that the themes and the ideas behind Once Upon a Time in Hollywood are pretty, pretty upfront. You know, it's like what Trudy says to Rick, where he, she was talking about the, you know, the art of acting, and she's just like, it's really just about the process of trying to get better and trying to be a better person. Yeah. That that is like the point of this movie. Best quote. We mentioned a lot of them, but I have to throw in. I could be one pool party away from starring in a Polanski movie. Yeah. That kills me. Uh, what do you have for best quotes? Anything? Um, we mentioned a lot. Hey, Dennis Hopper, move this fucking piece of shit. It's <laughs> <laughs> a good one. Hey, you could do anything you want with him. Shit, throw him off a building, right? Light him on fire. Hit him with a Lincoln, right? Get creative. Do whatever you want. He's just happy for the opportunity. <laughs> there you go. Could this be remade as a 10-episode Netflix series? Uh, that's the next category. Not only could it have been remade, I think a lot of directors would have chosen to play it that way and take a giant tech, uh, check from Ted Sarandos or whoever, or Apple. I mean, he started to experiment with releasing extended cuts on Netflix. I would definitely watch like however long he wanted to make this. I would watch the version. This easily could have been a 10-episode series, though. I think we all agree. And, you know, he's been threatening doing five episodes of Bounty Law. Like, for real. Yeah, he's like, I Make wrote the Bounty Law scripts. It's going to be weird if Leo's like, dude, I'm not doing Bounty Law. Like, I like, would guess that Leo's not going to do it. Yes. But, he, I mean, he, and he talks about potentially putting it on Netflix as a place where it could go. That's like when Will Ferrell made a Lifetime movie with K- Kristen Wiig, and nobody stopped them, and then it just kind of happened, and now it exists. And they spent, like, four weeks of their lives doing that. Well, especially in the context of Tarantino saying... I'm not doing any more movies, but I definitely want to make 300 minutes of Bounty Law. Yeah. <laughs> I wrote a Star Trek and, and, and want to make five Bounty Laws and then one more movie that you guys get. Yeah. Probably unanswerable questions is our second to last category. Did Cliff kill his wife? Yes. 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 Accidentally or? No. <laughs> intentionally. It's purposefully ambiguous. <laughs> That's why it's a probably unanswerable question. Do you think he killed his wife? Probably. He seems like a shithead. I say yes. What do Rick's next 10 years on IMDb look like? So this is the big thing is that That's good. in that in that interview that I mentioned that Tarantino did with Kim Morgan, he t- they basically go through what happens if Rick Dalton gets the John Cassavetes role in R- Rosemary's Baby. And he like has thought this out so deeply. He's like... I don't think Roman Polanski would have liked him, but in some ways I don't think he liked John Cassavetes, so I think that there's a possibility. And it's like, if he plays the, char- the Guy Woodhouse character in, in Rosemary's Baby, obviously he has a very different career, but in Tarantino's mind, he just winds up on streets of San Francisco. I think he has that, and this is what I grew up with as a kid in the 70s, where he's on all those shows, streets of San Francisco, Charlie's Angels, Vegas... He's like the equal. Rockford Files. He's just hitting all those and getting older and older and looking worse and worse. What if he became like the host of Family Feud? <laughs> oh. Like Match Game? Or, or Match Game or anyone. What was the whammy Joker's one? Joker's Wild? What was the whammy game? Press My Luck? Press My Luck. Yeah. Couldn't you? Because, you know, that's what happened to a lot of those guys, too, is they tried to be actors in the 50s and 60s. They did a lot of television. Didn't totally work out. But yeah. they were inherently telegenic. And they got jobs as game show hosts. I think he definitely makes a movie that 30 years later they do on Mystery Science Theater 3000. Sure. Is yeah. a mortal lock. Any other uh, probably unanswerable questions? 
No, mine was what happens to these people afterwards. Who won the movie? Last category. DiCaprio. Chris is so certain. Jesus. You don't want to explain it? Or? DiCaprio does, like, low-key six roles in this movie. Like, the, the versions of who he's playing in this movie are so varied. Like, the, the, the version of Rick who's talking to the Kurt Russell stuntman in the tux when he's still a little bit more successful and is trying to get Cliff a job. I guess that... Is that on Green Hornet that they're working on? Yes. And then the version of him that winds up in Lancer later. I mean, like, every single time. And then he's also playing roles within those roles. And the whole time, it's just, like, such a mind-blowing piece of acting. I kind of don't think it's a, much of a question. Is he your best actor for 2019? Yeah, him or Driver, I think. Driver? Yeah. You want to do some Driver it's for a us? Huge, a huge Kylo Ren guy. Do any Driver? Yeah. <laughs> Just so moving, you know? So moving. Yeah, that guy just like really loved his sister or whoever she was, but like he was like. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it was either him or Driver, yeah. I'm surprised you haven't done any um, Caleb Dakatu impressions, <laughs> you know? Like, you haven't done like, she play her chili pepper heart out. Yeah, you know, right. You don't, you don't want to do any of that now? No, I think we're good, yeah. <laughs> I, th I think Qu Quentin wins all of his movies. It's, an, it's a definitively Quentin Tarantino thing. No other person could have made it. No other person really cares about this stuff as much as he does. And every time he makes a movie, he wins his movie. Well, I think we, we know what's going to happen next time Sean goes to Equinox. Nice. <laughs> Definitely coffee on Quentin at the next Equinox <laughs> run-in. I think Pitt won the movie. We rarely split like this. No. Yeah. I walked away from that movie being like, Brad Pitt's incredible. Yeah. And, I, and I just he was the first guy I thought of. I come to expect the greatness from Tarantino. Mm -hmm. Pitt, I th I'd given up on. And you think about, uh, you know, Leo, he hadn't made a movie since The Revenant, right? Yeah. Five years? That's yeah. Right. Tarantino worked on this script for five years. Pitt, the last good movie he made was 2015. What was it? I, had it, it I think 15 was The Revenant. Right, but what about Pitt? Oh, Pitt. What's the last good Pitt movie? He wasn't he's, starring in it, but he was in the movie that was good. He's in 12 Years a Slave, which he produced, too. Yeah, uh, but World I'd given up on him yeah. and thought that, you know, the, he obviously had a pretty public breakup. It was pretty ugly, and it seemed like he was going this way a little bit, and then he just came roaring back, and it's been nice to have him back. Yeah. So I'm giving it to Pitt. What am I going to do? Just out of curiosity, let's do, let's do Sounds of Your Voice. Who won the movie? Do you agree with Chris, Leo DiCaprio? Okay. Do you agree with Sean Tarantino? That Do you agree with me, Brad Pitt? Win the movie. Yeah. Oh, you still got it. I still got it. Still throwing low 90s with, uh, with some speed Just a couple corners. Tommy Johns away. Yeah, that's it was right. all that jostling when he took his shirt off. Yeah. So, yeah, man. You were like, this Brad Pitt is jostle. still strong. Yeah. Yeah. He's still very a strong man. <laughs> Do you think... <laughs> strong. Do you think Tarantino told him to took the shirt off or Pitt ad-libbed the shirt takeoff? Do you think he was like, Quinn, you know, I've been thinking about this scene a lot. What, it needs what if he took his shirt off? Would it be list. better if He's like, I was fucking jacked? He's like, the beach is over jacked. there. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I think it was Tarantino told him to do it. Because yeah. I think this is a theme of Tarantino movies. He likes to revive superstars, yeah. and he's the fixer. Yeah. And, we, and clearly one of his goals for this movie was Brad Pitt is one of the biggest fucking stars the last 35 years, and I'm bringing all of that out of him. I think also he got two of the three or four best performances out of both Brad and Leo in their careers. Which is Alto, that's yeah. you know, Inglorious Bastards and yeah. Django and now this together for the, for the both of them. And if we're going backwards, Travolta. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think Reservoir. I mean, he's pulled out some of the best Kaitel. He's Madsen. definitely gotten the best Madsons, yeah. And and his Cadillac. Yeah. I Tim, think after best the Tim movie. Roths, probably, yeah. Jamie Foxx. Jamie Foxx? Should we just say all the actors in yeah. all of his movies? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> David Carradine? Well, yeah. <laughs> This Clue was, Gulliger, <laughs> some of his best work. But this was <laughs> one Lenin of the him. great uh, Tarantino what-ifs was Will Smith deciding not to do Django. Yeah. And Biggest that's mistake how Jamie Foxx gets it. And that's, you know, Will Smith, that becomes Brad Pitt in this movie, I think, for Will Smith. I yeah, think I would have preferred Smith it with Will Smith. Will Smith did do Focus, Smith. though. That's, that's a good point. Uh, yeah, maybe he made the right choice. I love Focus. Um, Thanks to Sundance TV and thanks to Peroni. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. Appreciate it.